Main Street today in West Orange is one of the busiest and oldest traveled routes in town. It basically followed the route of an old Indian trail leading west from Newark over the Orange Mountains. The early settlers to the area may have found it as a narrow Indian trail through a wilderness. But beginning about 1705, with continued use, it eventually became a passable and practical highway and evolved over three centuries as the main street we know today. It's safe to assume that modern development has wiped away any evidence of things that may have existed along Main Street on the old colonial route and nothing remains to be seen. Or is there? To the trained eye, there is something that actually has survived for over 300 years, very close to Main Street. Its name has not changed and its physical appearance has been only slightly modified, but remains hidden in plain view along modern day Main Street. On today's program, we will explore the history of the Wigwam Brook and trace its source to the nearby headwaters as we examine its amazing journey through time as it winds its way through and around the familiar roads of home today. I'm your host, Joe Fagan, and welcome to this episode of Discover West Orange. This monthly program is sponsored by the Downtown West Orange Alliance and is dedicated to raising awareness and preserving our rich local history. So stay tuned as we travel back in time and uncover history along modern day Main Street and better understand it, perhaps as the first settlers saw it, as we discover West Orange. be hard by today's standards to imagine the wilderness that once occupied the land of current day West Orange. The forest could provide lumber to build homes and hunting small game could provide a means of food. But because trees and animals could be found just about anywhere in a rural countryside, being close to a natural water source was the most important factor in finding a suitable place to live. So many of the early paths and trails through the region often paralleled the numerous small brooks and streams which provided an essential source of fresh water for the early settlers. The Wigwam Brook of West Orange is one of those small brooks which likely has carved out a path down the steep slope of the Orange Mountains since the dawn of time. A book written by Stephen Wicks in 1892 details Essex County history from 1666 to 1806 and tells her the origin of the name for the Wigwam Brook. Wick stated that a small nomad group of the Lenny Lenape Indians were known to have first settled along the brook in the 1670s and built their wigwams. Thus, it was given the name of the Wigwam Brook by the early settlers to the area. The earliest reference to that name of the Wigwam Brook first appeared on a survey in 1686 and the name has since endured 329 years of history to this very day. The headwaters of the Wigwam Brook can be traced to this location here, just east of Valley Way on the West Orange Montclair border in an area once known as Crystal Springs. The water travels through underground springs from the higher elevations as it drains the first mountain in and around the area of Eagle Rock. From here the water flows east through West Orange and Orange before emptying into the Second River in Bloomfield. From there it goes on to the Passaic River and empties into Newark Bay. Here near the headwaters of the Wigwam Brook, directly behind me, is an old stone structure likely dating to the 19th century. I really don't know what it could have been used for, perhaps it was part of a dam or perhaps the foundation for a mill of some kind, uh, but it's still standing here and speaks volumes to the history of life along the Wigwam. After leaving the source of the headwaters on the West Orange Montclair border, the Wigwam Brook goes into a long underground tunnel and travels completely hidden from view beneath the Eagle Rock Co-op Apartments and the Vanderhoof Bus Company lot at the bottom of Wilford Street and Mississippi Avenue. The other end of the tunnel emerges above ground at the bottom of Allen Street off Valley Way 
and here the Wigwam Brook flows in a stone culvert running parallel to Mississippi Avenue. It travels for a short distance, snaking practically unnoticed behind residential homes before going back into a tunnel at the bottom of Maple Street. Here the brook is only visible on one side of the street as it once again disappears underground as it continues its journey along Mississippi Avenue toward Main Street. I'm standing at the bottom of Elm Street where the Wigwam Brook passes directly underneath me after entering the tunnel on Maple Street. You can't see it, but you can hear the sound of water flowing very aggressively from the storm sewer grate. At one time, the brook flowed above ground here, and this concrete guardrail behind me, now long obsolete, is a surviving artifact from the small bridge that once passed over the brook at this location. This concrete guardrail could date to 1894, when the trolley to Eagle Rock first ran here along Mississippi Avenue. Also in the parking lot behind me, a home erected as early as 1730 by Amos Williams used the waters of the Wigwam Brook for domestic and irrigation purposes. As I mentioned earlier, a nearby source of water was essential to the early settlers, so they usually built their homes along small brooks or streams. From the tunnel that begins on Maple Street, the Wigwam Brook flows directly under Elm Street and Mississippi Avenue. This is a fairly long tunnel that travels under Harrison Avenue businesses at the bottom of Eagle Rock Avenue. It emerges on the other side along Main Street, where it actually exits from a large underground chamber beneath a building. As is the case with any flowing body of water, such as a small brook or stream, it's inevitable that it's going to attract the attention of curious and adventurous kids. During the summer of 1946, heavy rains had caused the Wigwam Brook to swell to nearly three foot in depth. At the location directly behind me here on the bank, three kids were playing. When they witnessed an older kid who tried to cross to the other side, he fell in the brook. He got swept away by the raging waters and was carried for a distance of almost a mile through various culverts and tunnels. Those three young men watched in horror before the young man was eventually rescued in Orange. Joining me now is Ron Fay, who was one of those three small boys in July of 1946 who had witnessed what had happened. Well, we were down here playing along the edges of the Wigwam Brook. The brook had swollen probably three or four feet up the side banks due to a big rainstorm two days before. And uh, we're just down here throwing rocks into the water and things like that, and uh, I was here with Fred McGuire and Jimmy McGuire and Alan McDougall, and Alan was a bit older than us. He was in the Army at the time, and he was on leave, I believe, and uh, he decided that he was going to go across the brook over to where Hanley's had thrown out a lot of their waste bottles from the bar, and he believed that there was still some whiskey and wine left in the bottom of the bottles. And being an adult, I think he was 18 or 19, he just wanted to check and see if there was anything in them. And uh, he was going to cross the brook. And it was raging, believe me. And uh, we all advised him, don't, don't, don't. You know, I was only 10 years old at the time. And Freddie was the same, 10 years old. Jimmy was older. He was about 18 or 19. And uh, he disregarded our warnings stepped into the brook. As soon as he let go of the wall, he was swept away down the brook. And it was raging, believe me. Now, did you, did you think that uh, he was joking around or fooling around? Or yeah, we, we uh, did, did, did you, you didn't initially realize how serious it was? And uh, as he started to get swept away uh, out of sight and you realized there was nothing that you could do for him, uh, what happened next? Well, we tried to follow him down the riverbank. We stayed up on the wall and ran down as quick as we could. We could not catch up to him. But he was waving his arms. He was floating down on his back. And uh, we thought he was just waving to us, so we were waving back. But we didn't realize that he was in such trouble. He went under the bridge on Ashwood Avenue, and then he went past the gas station, which was Mulvey's at the time, in the back. And he went through a tunnel under the football field for Edison Junior High School, 
which is at least 125 or 130 yards long. And they came out the other end and proceeded down further. We lost track of them by then. We couldn't keep up with them. So now you guys uh, realized that he was in, in danger, nothing you could do for him. Uh, you went into Mulvey's and you, uh, you told them what happened and they contacted the police. And, and where did you guys go after that? Uh, we tried to run around, get down a football field and run down a football field. Of course, we had been delayed by, you know, passing the information on to Mulvey's gas station. And we never did see him again. He went right down under Franklin Avenue Bridge, past Washington School, down into Orange. And as I understand it, there was a man down there that saw him in the brook in Orange and helped him get out. So he had, he had actually, once he fell into the brook, he had traveled easily for a distance of, uh, I would say, close to a mile. Now, when was the next time you saw him? Uh, next time we saw him was two days later. Uh, they took him to the hospital and checked him out. And uh, he did not get home that day, as far as I remember, because we lived right next door to where he was staying with his aunt on Elm Street. And uh, he was okay. He had a few bumps and bruises, but no broken bones or anything like that. And uh, I think he went back to his uh, army base. I think it was Bayonne Navy Yard. They were working on some army projects over there. So he was in the army at the time, and as you mentioned before, he was a little bit older than you guys and uh, supposedly knew better, but as fate turned out, uh, he didn't, and uh, he went into, and went into the brook. Now, after this incident, did you guys continue to play in the brook? Uh, were you unfazed by what had happened, or did you uh, keep that in the back of your mind and uh, always proceeded with a certain level of caution as to not get swept in the brook, as Alan did? Oh, we would never go in the brook if it was raging like that, no way. And uh, after that, we went home, of course, and we spread the word around that he'd been swept down the brook. And everybody thought it was terrible and amazing and stupid and you name it, and they put a, a, a name on it. But uh, he turned out okay. He was not injured seriously. And uh, after that, I don't know, a week or so after that, he went back to wherever he was going, and I never saw him again after that. Now, you were a West Orange resident your whole life, and you also uh, served on the West Orange Police Force for a good number of years. Do you know of any other incident uh, in, in West Orange history uh, where someone had fell in the brook and, and got swept uh, through all those tunnels? No, not in my whole 30 years on the police department. Actually, 33 years. No, I never witnessed or heard of or attended another incident that bad. Let's put it that way. Now, we, we were talking a little earlier, and I mentioned to you, you know, some of these tunnels, they look a little scary to even venture in under normal circumstances. So I can't imagine what it must have been like to get swept through. And it certainly is, is an amazing tale of, of, of survival. Uh, can you tell me anything more about uh, your days growing up in West Orange along the Wigwam Brook, what you guys would typically do? Well, yes, we used to come down to the brook to play. <clears throat> Sometimes we'd go under the old bowling alley on Harrison Avenue and look for rats in there. And we'd take rocks with us and throw rocks at them. Uh, we did find a few occasionally. And we used to go over to the back door of Rabbit Hanley's old bar. And we'd take some bottles and throw them in the brook and break them. They were the old whiskey and wine bottles that they had thrown out for garbage. And there was a pile there, probably four or five feet deep, things like that. And we played in a brook and went through the tunnels. And of course, at that age, you're very adventuresome and you want to see what's on the other end of the tunnel. So I probably went through with Freddie, Freddie McGuire and I were buddies. We probably went through that tunnel under the football field, oh, 50 times just fooling around, going through, running, yelling in the air, making an echo and stuff like that. Yes. Well, that, that's, that's pretty amazing. And I'm sure uh, at the end of the day, you, you'd come home, you'd be home in time for dinner, and your, your mother or father would say, what'd you do today, Ron? And you probably answer just like I did to my mother and father. Nothing really. That's correct, yes. Yeah, we tell them we played in a brook or we played over a Colgate field or we walked up to Eagle Rock and back, you know, things like that. But, but not many details were, were too forthcoming except the day that Alan fell in the brook. 
yes, that was very exciting. We couldn't wait to tell people. Well, thank you so much, Ron, uh, certainly for your service to the Township of West Orange, and, and thank you for uh, joining us on Discover West Orange today and, and sharing the amazing story about the boy who fell in the brook. Okay, Joe, you're certainly welcome, and any time I can help out with a little history, I'm glad to oblige. Thank you. I'm here at the field in front of Edison Middle School on Main Street. Before the Wigwam Brook reaches this location, it passes under a bridge on Ashwood Terrace and then passes under the entire length of this field. As Ron Fay mentioned earlier, this is the same tunnel that Alan McDougall passed through when he got swept into the raging waters of the brook in 1946. Before the Edison School opened in 1926, the brook ran above ground in a low-lying natural culvert until the tunnel was constructed and covered over to create this field. During the late 1700s, the Williams family, who were one of the first settlers in the area, operated a mill at this location powered by the flowing waters of the Wigwam Brook. Once the brook emerges on the other side of the Edison Field, it flows behind several Main Street businesses, showcasing the quality of the workmanship of the retaining walls built during the 1930s by the WPA. These walls have now become part of the forgotten West Orange landscape as they go practically unnoticed today. Hi, I'm Megan Brill, Executive Director of the Downtown West Orange Alliance. We will return to this episode of Discover West Orange with Joe Fagan in a moment. Our town is full of rich history and proud traditions, as West Orange continues to be a community where families have lived for generations. I would like to remind everyone that many of the goods and services you purchased outside of our community are available downtown. Small and mid-sized businesses, ranging from restaurants to retail, with a variety of professional services, including legal and medical, can be found in the Main Street Corridor. Four municipal parking lots on street parking provide quick access to most downtown businesses. Variety, convenience, and friendly smiles are all components making the West Orange community the place to visit and keep coming back. I strongly urge all residents to visit and shop downtown and catch the energy. We'll be back with the conclusion of our story about the Wigwam Brook in just a few minutes. First, I would like to talk about another West Orange landmark that we all have passed countless times. I'm talking about this attractive wall mural that has become the defining image for the West Orange Public Library. It has blended so well into our local landscape that it is now easily taken for granted. I went to the studios of the artist Ellen Hanauer to find out more about the creative process and how she came about to choose this design entitled Wall of Inspiration and Dreams. My name is Ellen Hanauer. I grew up in West Orange, went to school in West Orange, and I have a studio in Verona, uh, on the outskirts of West Orange now. I am an exhibiting commissioned artist, and I've been for the past 20 years. Now, Ellen, you're responsible for the wall mural at the West Orange Public Library, and uh, I just left that location, and uh, it was glistening in the sunlight, and it's, it's beautiful to see that and, and uh, illuminated by the sun in the background. Now, tell us a, a little bit about how that came to be. The mural uh, was one of the commissioned projects in West Orange, and it was originally slated for West Orange High School. It was going to be in the whole back of the building. Um, and the original concept was to show the high school kids in silhouette and we polled them and had all of their uh, their intended careers uh, documented and those were all going to be in the back of the building. Um, for various reasons the mural was moved last minute and so um, the library was kind enough to, to give us the location there and we kept the basic design um, had a, a different age diversification than was originally intended, but 
uh, and and basically use the words of of um, the action words of what would happen within a library, what would beckon people to come into the West Orange Library. Now you know that's that's a very good point because uh, uh, I mentioned uh, earlier in, in my intro to you that um, I think it's a defining image of the West Orange Public Library, and uh, I, I didn't even see those words uh, there. Uh, of course, they're part of the mural, and the mural is just so inviting, uh, asking you to come into the library, come into this center of knowledge, and and those words are, are kind of just in the background, and, and, and I don't think most people see those words. Now, the mural is entitled Wall of Inspiration and Dream. Tell us a little bit about the wording that's on the mural. I have to give credit where credit was due. And uh, Susan Borg, the town planner at the time, felt that the action words would uh, would beckon people in, and um, and so it was just a matter of brainstorming what would people get out of uh, the library. And I have a connection to the West Orange Library as well because my mother worked there for so many years in the front desk. Now, um, what kind of feedback do you get? Uh, do people uh, say, oh, Ellen, we saw your work, we love your work. Uh, what kind of feedback do you get, positive or negative? I get a lot of feedback from that. Um, and my parents get, tell me that uh, they're, they meet people and uh, they know my name from, from seeing it on the, on the mural. So it's it's been wonderful. It's reached a lot of people, and I met a lot of people. While I was on the scaffolding. People did stop by, and and we chatted, and it was it was a great experience. Now you also did the side of the uh, West Orange shuttle bus that is uh, still seen around town, uh, and you said that there's a lot of symbolism uh, on there. Can you explain some of uh, what symbolism exists on that bus so that people see it on the street, they can take a closer look at it and, and see if they can find what you're talking about? Well, look for familiar faces. So uh, look for Thomas Edison. Look for um, John McKeon, Assemblyman John McKeon. Jerry Tarnoff, who was superintendent of schools at the time and such an important figure in the history of the, uh, the schools in, in um, certainly in the past 40 plus years. Well, Ellen, thank you so much for joining us on Discover West Orange today and uh, giving us a little insight to the creative process. Uh, and thank you for doing the, doing the wall mural at the West Orange Public Library. Thank you, Joe. And now back to the conclusion of your story on the Wigwam Brook in West Orange. As we continue with our story on the Wigwam Brook, it's worth noting that the construction of the tunnels and retaining walls along the brook all through West Orange and Orange were built in the 1930s by local men hired by the Works Progress Administration, or WPA as it was known. This was one of the many programs instituted by President Franklin Roosevelt to help fight rising unemployment during the Great Depression. So the stone walls are only about 80 years old and one of only a few changes that were made along the original natural course of the Wigwam Brook in West Orange. The brook crosses under Franklin Avenue behind the Holy Trinity Church and continues above ground as it skirts its way around the Washington Street School. In the days before the Revolutionary War, Samuel Harrison used the waters of the Wigwam Brook to power his sawmill located near this location once again giving us an example of how vital these small brooks and streams were to the early settlers of West Orange. The brook crosses Whittlesey Avenue here at John Street and runs above ground before once again entering into a tunnel carrying the brook under Washington Street and into Orange on its way to the Passaic River in Newark Bay before eventually emptying into the Atlantic Ocean. Today the water which has flowed for more than three centuries by the name of the Wigwam Brook through West Orange still run shallow, but the forgotten history will always run deep. For the downtown West Orange Alliance, I'm Joe Fagan, and I'll see you on Main Street.